two and one. Hi everybody, welcome to another live stream here um, from from Ray, New Zealand. Uh, we'd like to welcome you today to a um, awesome in interview with Dr. Maggie Buxton from here from Techno um, Creative Technology Northland. Uh, she's got a doctorate in creative technology and um, and knows a lot about the whole environment of digital uh, media, digital technology, especially. And I've met her, interviewed her uh, previously, and even though we haven't seen each other for about a year, but yeah, <laughs> great friend, uh, very smart person, and I'm going to let her introduce herself. Yeah. Well, thank you, Ari, for inviting me along. Um, I have a bit of a, I guess I'm a bit of a cross-disciplinary practitioner, so I um, I do a lot of arts. Um, I have my own production company called Arfi World, which I've been doing for a number of years, um, some of which with my partner, Kim, who's also a creative technologist. Myself and Matt um, Keen started uh, Creative Technology Northland. I'm on the board of Ada Aotearoa, which is a national di digital arts organisation. I'm the co-chair of that. Um, and I've worked, I guess, about 27 years in community um, development, strategic development, um, education, capacity building, all those areas. So I guess my practice kind of blues all those things together. But it's a bit hard because I'm a bit of an ungenerable character. <laughs> well, like most artists, multi multitasking. <laughs> That's right. Um, tell us about NADA just before we move on to Northern. Tell us about... Uh, uh, NADA? Ada, did you say Ada? Oh, Ada. Ada. Um, Aotearoa Digital Arts Network. Um, it's been around since the mid to early 2000s. Um, and it's a, a large um, network. It's, I guess, different nodes, regional nodes of individuals who work in very loosely, I guess you could call it digital arts practice, but it's probably more like cross-disciplinary practice. A lot of people working in that space between science, arts and technology. Um, and Ada has done lots of different projects. They tend to have lots of, pro um, I guess, quite academic um, based or publication based stuff. So they do symposia and that kind of thing and quite sophisticated projects um, involving lots of different kinds of practitioners. So we're right in the process now at Ada of, um, I guess, reinvigorating the organisation. Um, we've just had a series of different meetings to see what we do next and how that best supports people. Um, but it's one of those organisations that, ha um, that have, along with Creative Tech Northland, I guess, that are now having probably a lot more currency even than before. And so far as we're mostly practitioners who work in that space that's online, connected, um, all that kind of thing. Probably a, in some ways more already resilient than a lot of other organisations. Yeah. Um, so let's go into um, uh, Creative Technology Northland. And what you do there? Um, so Matt and I founded that um, organisation um, would have been a couple of years ago now at a May um, 2018 Tech Week, and we I guess had this idea that if both of us were working in creative tech and each of us knew people who were that there was a network that probably needed some connecting or some cool people who could do with meeting up and chatting about stuff. So we started out with about 15 people on a rainy night in May of that year, and we now have a couple of hundred people online in our Facebook group. And probably a core um, of that, probably a core group of about 50 to 70 individuals actively really working in the area with a, some extra teachers, some extra people who are in other art forms who are interested in getting into it and so forth, making up the difference. Um, we ran a really successful um, pop-up event called Strand Lab last year, which was a, you, I think you came along, which was like an innovation hub. And we we also um, do lots of different kind of capacity building um, stuff. A little bit more will be coming up, but capacity building for people in our network mainly. Um, and quite a lot of networking um, between us and other groups who are wanting to engage in creative technology. So, or just wanting to connect around practice. Um, there's, there's quite a few groups, I guess, that have that kind of creative technology focus. So there'd be, you know, software developer group um, that Lance runs. There's the Whangarei Freelance Network, which has a lot of individual, individual service people in it. Um, there's obviously 
Creative um, Northland has uh, engages with a number of people. So there's a lot of groups that Chris are we on, and, and also um, NGen, which is a I guess Maori digital arts collective. So we kind of connect with all of those. So we're not really an umbrella group. I guess we're kind of a node that connects with others. And we tend to be a group that includes people who are interested in that or want to build their capacity in that. Like it might be fine artists who haven't done digital stuff yeah. or more commercial um, people who are interested in doing more art stuff. So it kind of uh, has a quite a large group of it. Um, it's, it's quite an inclusive understanding of creative tech. So it includes media companies as well as artists, as well as entrepreneurs. So with uh, with the lockdown, how have you guys been able to um, carry on um, meetings and, uh, I mean, obviously Zoom and all that, but much, you know, have, has there been any other sort of uh, focused uh, meetings? Um, well, actually, interestingly, um, one of our gr a very core cool group member, Lawrence Levine, has his own version of Zoom, which is much more interesting, called Horn. And so we've been having meetings on Horn during the lockdown. Um, Horn is that like is, Horn? Um, with the E or H O R N, and so it's a um, has it's similar capacity to Zoom, but it's not web accessed. I think you tend to download it and have it on your own server, as I understand it. But it's it's um, yeah, it's been a really good tool because obviously it's someone who lives locally who's got their own conferencing yeah. system that they're selling around the world. So um, so we have met we've met during the lockdown several times actually in different capacities. Uh, and also online, um, there's a few people in the group um, and people who've joined the group who are working in the PPE instructable creating area. So there have been people who've been 3D printing PPE um, equipment. Um, yeah. There's also people in the group who've been, uh, not as a, I'm not saying that, that they're doing it on behalf of the group, I'm saying this members of the group have are doing that. And there's also quite a few people working in digital services, getting a lot of businesses up and running. Um, with websites yeah. and e-commerce e stuff, um, so yeah, a lot of um, a lot of people in the group are very active and of themselves, doing very interesting things. So, with um, as you mentioned, uh, digital um, business and stuff, how have you? I mean, has businesses reached out to you in this time to uh, when they've haven't before because they haven't, you know, that even though I know as digital people we go, hey, look, you guys need to get online, you guys need to get a bit more. Facebook or all that. Go, no, 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 we're not into that. But have have these pe people come out of the shell of this period and said, hey, we we are realised. Have you had much contact with businesses um, doing that? Y yes, I've had people contact me individually because I have a few different hats in the community because obviously I do a lot of strategic consulting kind of in, you know, a lot of parallel universes. Um, so I had people contact me in that capacity um, from different with different kinds of ideas in mind. Um, I've also know that people, I've also facilitated individual um, connections with people I know who are in that, who are looking for work or wanting work or do that work. So I've put people directly in touch with others. Um, I think generally speaking, um, there's quite a, there's been quite a rush, particularly for certain businesses that maybe weren't as digitally savvy previously, I'd say HOSPO, for example, et cetera. Um, and there's been some nice solutions developed in the community ind independent of what we do. Like I think mm. Stephanie Barnes has been part of a, I think it's New Zealand North or something, some Northland, something or other, which is like a, a page for a meta page for different groups. Um, yep. There's also a, uh, someone else in the country has done their own Uber version of Uber. It's a five percent service charge, but it's a local version of Uber, for example. Hmm. That's not a local thing, but that's a New Zealand thing. But I think that has application. So yes, no, I have been contacted. Yeah. I guess my main thing um, has been to either quickly get them in touch with someone or to ask them some questions because actually, genuinely speaking, a lot of those businesses have infrastructure they could use to actually sell their product. It's just that they somehow hear that they need to have an app or an e-commerce site on the website, and they're, and I'm just trying yeah. to say to them, no, you don't actually need that to to do what you want to do. You, you could literally just have a Facebook page and get people to PM you, or yeah. and, or have a phone number on it and get them to ring and just give them your account. Like there's ways you can still do your business without having a massive investment, and in some ways it's actually I think smarter in the medium term or short term, I should say. 
for businesses to um, quickly reach the customer in the platforms they have already. Um, yeah. And um, and then, I guess, bide and wait and then just see what's emerging in the field because they could actually be part of a meta product to save themselves having their own website, for example. But, you know, there's some yeah. of that stuff's in train. Um, I don't. I would rather businesses not invest twenty to you know five to whatever it is thousand dollars when they need to be paying money for rent and wait rates when they could just get a quick and dirty page up and they've already got like a gazillion followers already. You know what I mean? Like they don't yeah. need to have a bunch of other stuff, or they could just be smarter about how they post on groups and yeah. local groups and things. So yeah, a little bit of that. I've just been doing a bunch of free consulting for people just to help them in that way. I don't want to see people burn. Um, in this environment, yeah, I think um, like when you when you're unaware of um, what's available, you think, well, somebody will come up, and go, hey, this thing here, and it's a you know, it look feels looks like a really really good deal, and then you realize five months down the road, it was nothing, and they were out of pocket. But I mean, social media is where it's at. As long as you know, if you do get involved with some other app, you can use your social media to get them to use that app but you're right um i think this whole idea of the uber thing because i know that like a lot of businesses even though we think they're locally based aren't actually locally based and you know the funds actually go over investment funds go overseas profits go overseas and doesn't stay in the um in the country and to see something like um the horn system hopefully you know a lot more people in, in northland and new zealand will use it um, and also tell us a bit about the 3D printing side of things because you're involved in a, a few of the things there. Um, no, I'm not involved in it. There have been, um, so what happened with that was there was a member of our group and I'm, I haven't got my group page in front of me. So uh, no, I don't mean, I don't mean the uh, mask or anything like that, but the actual uh, side of that, um, that, that industry locally, is there, is there an industry locally? No, I, I, I'd say no. Um, the 3D printing is a little bit like, um, well, depends on what you call industry. Um, there are people who sell 3D printers locally um, okay. so, um, or who lease them. Um, and um, Rico um, Whangarei is a 3D printer seller. They, they sell, I think, uh, is it MakerBot mm. um, brand? Um, there are people who have... There's a few people here who have 3D printers, like a very small amount. Um, yeah. And there's some in the community. Obviously, there's one in the library, for example. Wayne yeah. Carroll has one, um, two or three people in the group, and including the lady who runs Rico have 3D printers. So um, so in, I think in the 3D printers tends to be something where people have it usually in their house. Or if, yeah. they, if they exist, then they tend to be in, like, um, schools or... Baker Studios or something like that. Um, and with the PPE thing, that was a case of a, I think what happened was a, there was someone here who decided to do something directly with the DHB and there were some other people who did went through a national organisation mm. that was wanting some people in their homes to create stuff locally. So there was some, sort of distributed network stuff happening. So that was kind of a nice response. I haven't heard much about what's happened about that next. I mean, the biggest thing about 3D printing is that it just, you know, depending on how you configure it, it can take quite a long time to, to and also the consumables. You know, there's quite a lot of consumable yeah. plastic involved. Um, I think you can get it recycled now. I don't know. It's not really my area per se. But anyway, it's, it's a thing that people are interested in. Uh, they We kind of joke um, some of myself and some of the colleagues who work in, I guess, pure creative tech often joke because people kind of set up these like maker spaces and the and the, the way you call them a maker space is if you've bought a 3D printer. Yeah. It's kind of like a it's kind of a thing, like everyone wants to have the 3D printer thing. Um yeah. we don't have one, but I've used them successfully. I, I during Strand Lab, I think I knocked out like quite a few cats actually. There was some program for making little cats. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm interested interested in that so we can put out some figurines of our comic book characters. And so it's always me, like if there's somebody somebody locally who's renting them out, it would be good to have something over a couple of weeks and go, oh, yeah. But then, of yeah, course, there's a part of designing that, you know, the, the designing, uh, coming up with the, um, what is that, the architect design of um, the, thing you're printing. the ribs. Yeah, of the actual print 
that comes out right. physically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, there's actually quite a lot of sites you can get that stuff. Um, there's definitely people who can do 3D modeling. You know, there's people locally who can do 3D modeling. There's a, oh, wow. a guy, um, there's also, I mean, you know, depending on the system, it's not, it's not extremely difficult. Um, there's also someone, a couple of people locally, but one particular guy, Daniel, um, from Beta Form Solutions, he um, scans um, yeah. items in the environment and then creates 3D models from those scans. His previous experience was in the German motor vehicle, auto, auto vehicle industry. So he was yeah. part of Strand Lab and he did some nice collaborations with different artists who had, made, um, for example, ceramic or Maori um, traditional um, artifacts and he would scan, re scan them and then, you know, you could make a essentially a 3D model in space, a digital version. But those yeah. could be reconfigured re to then be rendered in 3D printing. It's another, essentially, a bit of a slightly different process. Some work better than others, but that's yeah. another way of doing it. So, yes, that's definitely, that's kind of fun. It's nice to have people, you know, definitely, um, if, if, you know, if Rico are watching, then um, you can PM me offline. I could give you the contact for that. Excellent. Yeah, I think um, it, it, it's... I mean, it's kind of like um, 3D printing gets rid of the whole uh, having to find 10 different people to work on one little project, you know, because and, and to be contact with some big, huge industry to be able to do that or some factory overseas. Whereas if you have it locally, you know, uh, two, three people and you're off the ground to do something like, you know, figure, figure design stuff. I know especially with like the gaming side of things, people, you know, like to have their own models that they can play around with on on say D and D and stuff, on different things. One of the um, let me see. Um, let's talk about pro Project Afi. Mm -hmm. um, Afi World. Yeah. Yeah. So Afi World is my um, essentially my production company. Um, it started. I guess the first iteration of it was in two thousand eight. Um, and I, um, it was kind of a pre-PhD at that point. Um, Afi World was named after a pre-PhD um, game that I, an alternate reality game that I that I constructed and ran in South Auckland in that year. I was given some money from um, the European Commission to investigate alternate reality gaming. So I don't know if you know what ARGs are, but there are, I guess there are. Um, multi-platform game that is played in the real world and the um, digital world. So um, I'm trying to think of a, um, Ingress would be an example of that most recently or one of the, you know, so it's, it's something you can use on a device, but you can also um, go out somewhere and you might, for example, meet a character who's on a street corner or you, in those days you could phone somebody, phone a phone line and get an answer phone message. So there'd be all these different ways. So it's it, quite reality blurring. So I did a version of that as a three-month-long installation in a school um, quite successfully. And then it was called Afi World, which was essentially a parallel universe that ran alongside the school. And the students were, as part of their curriculum in the school, they were discovering this parallel universe through maths and social studies and art and so forth. Mm. And I had people beam in from different portals and I worked with local police. It was quite lo-fi in those days because we had like the police come with a, a, like a CD and play the CD in the school, and things like that, like this interdimensional. So it was kind of cool. And then, then I did my PhD and I think Arthi World as a company emerged directly after that. It was like a post-PhD mm. um, practical social enterprise that I set up. Um, and since then, since 2014, we've done, I think, 20 or 25 different projects. Um wow. And they are everything from um, some of which I've done with my partner Kim, Kim Mule, who's a who's got a, a master's in creative technology. So a good amount with him. Um, some with my just myself and other collaborators. Um, so they've been everything from um, interactive installation, um, either sound or um, sound and audio. They've been um, uh, augmented reality and geolocative mm -hmm. apps. Um, experiences, um, there have been um, collaborations for um, site-specific activations, so that um, Strand Lab, Innovation Lab was one of them, Job Lab was a recent one, um, that was an RFI World project that I did with a few other people, um, that was Ministry of Social Development and Chamber of Commerce led. Um, so 
the essence of it is that Afi World um, supports the spirit of place. So it can do that through almost pure production um, in a like an old shop setting up a recruitment thing without lots of bells and whistles. Or it can set up an interactive installation in a derelict tower, which is what we did in Nathan Homestead in Manarewa. Um, um, it can set up an app so you can walk around town and every time you get to a little alleyway, it plays a sound that's been curated from the artist, immersive yeah. sound. So fundamentally, it's about the spirit of place, but it's kind of enabling. And most uh, few world projects, in fact, in fact, all of them are collaborative. So they're usually with... Um, elders in rest homes, they are with um, Pacifica, cultural experts, Māori, mana whenua groups or marae, um, other artists um, of different kinds. So they always have a collaborative element. Um, it's, it, we do do gallery installations. We've currently got something called the Plant Room on in Whangarei Art Museum, mm -hmm. which is a digital interactive um, sound AV, AV installation essentially. So we do do gallery stuff, um, but it tends to be more in the community. E and even in that case, it's a site-specific work to support WAM, which essentially to, to you know, for various reasons. So yeah. it, the, the spirit of place and the, the site activation stuff is, is at its core, essentially. Let's talk about um, Tech Week. You guys are involved with that. And obviously, that's not going to sort of happen in the way it usually is happening. How um how is that going to be changed for this year, and what is uh, Tech Week about? Tech Week, um, we may or may not be involved with this year. My understanding is that it's going to be happening online to some extent, so it'll be its own, own online version. Tech Week is um, run by a group that I think of like they that's what they do. They do Tech Week, and they get funding for that. It tends to be locally run here by Northern Inc. So it's kind of has a number of people in different centres who are like the hosts or the facilitators for Tech Week in practice. Um, myself and others have been more or less involved. Um, we tend to do our own alternative Tech Week, to be really honest. Um, I'm not sure about the model for Tech Week. I'm not sure who in the end actually benefits from that. And and, and in terms of creative technology, I've, I've never really... Um, I, I think their, their understanding of tech is, in my experience, extremely narrow. Um, so, um, so yeah, I mean, I'm kind of the jury's out on Tech Week. That's not a, necessarily a bad thing, but it's, it's, it's kind of a mixed experience. It's kind of nice to raise the profile of tech. Um, whether, yeah. it, whether it's effective in raising the profile or supporting creative tech, I'm not sure, and um, whether or not it's of great benefit to all the people involved in it. Personally, I don't know, because we don't really get any funding for it. We just get some PR and some posters. So, yeah. um, so uh, in, in 20, I think it was 2018 or 2019, um, you guys did a, um, a amazing ANZAC um, installation at the RSA there on the side of the library. Did you have anything planned for this year going in or? Um, we did it for Armistice Day, um, and so it was 11-11, so Armistice Day. It was a projection mapping um, experience, so it was projected onto the side of the library. Kim actually did an amazing job of that because he live performed the visuals, and we got some nice content from Channel North, um, some, uh, I guess, war footage that they had created, it was, and also some stuff off the... Ministry of Culture and Heritage site, or like it was really, it was a nice project. It was kind of curated around that. Um, but who knows? I mean, I think um, it'd be nice. I, I like quite like doing stuff for ANZAC. I mean, not for for Armistice. Obviously, we couldn't do anything like that for this this year because ANZAC Day fell in a bit bad time. But potentially for um, Armistice Day, depending on 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 how that works and what's happening around this funny environment that we're in. Mm. Tell us about projection mapping a bit more. Um, so projection mapping is a, um, it has various names. People call it video mapping, 3D projection mapping. Essentially what it is, is a form of projection that wraps content um, or maps content to particular surfaces. So normally when you project something, let's say you've got a projector at home, you normally have like a white wall or some such, and it just beams it across the wall flat. It's like a surface, right? So projection mapping um, 
if that surface was a chimney or it was a tree or it was a car or it was a building, you could actually map the content so the content could be just in one window raining and another window could have someone popping up and it would fit to the window. It wouldn't beam over the side. It, you know, So it, it's kind of a way of mapping content directly to a, another surface. So Arthur would have done quite a lot of projection mapping. Um, Kim, had, we recently ran three workshops uh, where Kim and I facilitated those for Creative Northland um, as part mm. of their digital NYSF AF program. Um, it was a Creative Northland, um, North Tech, Ministry of Youth Development, Creative New Zealand funded project. Um, and so we worked in Kaipara and got a lot of people able to do that. Um, and we've done quite a few projection mapping projects, including WAM, the, the installation we've got at the moment, the Armistice Day thing you mentioned, um, Dargable Wearable Arts. We did a lot. Of, we did an immersive interactive installation inside and a, a map on the side of a building for that. Um, so it's something that we do. I think people really like it. It's not the most, how would I say it? It's, it's kind of one of those things where people, it, it's shiny and interesting for people because they go to Vivid or one of those big festivals and they see that stuff and they're like, ah, oh. mm. um, for us it's um, cool, but it's probably not the most interesting of the practice and research that we do. But it's, it's fun. It's like a fun thing that we do, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's because it's interactive. I mean, it involves, uh, I mean, like I know my, my dad was saying that is brilliant all the way from, uh, you know, Mordawa. And to see that because we were able to, you know, put it up on the Facebook but being involved in something like a group like uh, Crave Tech in Northland, you know, Technology Northland, you know, where do you guys see yourself coming out of this going forward? Um, well, I mean, I think we've got lots of plans at the moment in terms of, I think, particularly kind of more um, sharing knowledge out of our network to other networks. So we've got some blog stuff and some maybe little video things we're doing. Um, We've also got some different kinds of um, performance stuff that we're going to be doing as well. I think for me, the stuff that's interesting is where um, it's actually building the capacity of the person involved and educating others at the same time. So if we were doing a thing, for example, I think Kim and Lawrence might be doing something that's an online um, MIDI slash concert VJ type stuff that's live, um, which is a little bit different than filming someone doing something that's actually happening within your computer as you're watching it essentially so that stuff's interesting because it's fun research for them it tries out some stuff um it's interesting to look at and, and engaging content and different content um and also um builds the capacity of other artists to see what's possible with different platforms for me that's interesting um i kind of always want us to do stuff that everyone learns from rather than just do stuff for the sake of it um strain lab was another example it was a cool project because people came and they all learnt from each other and networked with one another and we had like 10 different events I think seven of those were capacity building workshops so for me it's about learning fundamentally about how we get people learning and capacity building so going forward um, some people in our network are struggling you know especially those who are probably in the more artistic events based area of mm. creative tech where they're essentially um, also I guess um, there's other people on the other end of the continuum who are probably overwhelmed with work. Um, yeah. So they're the ones who are being called on to do e-commerce sites and various other bits and pieces, like they're really overwhelmed. Um, there's some people who are kind of in between and they're a little bit worried about six months from now because often digital services and various other media stuff tends to be some of the stuff that gets cut when there's issues in the economy. It shouldn't really be. It's dumb thinking anyway, but... Yeah. But I guess, um, but for now, I think it's kind of a bit of a mixed bag, but generally speaking, okay in our sector, um, whereas obviously other sectors up here, are, you know, tourism, for example, and various other things are quite um, not great. Um, so what I'm, I guess, out of that, um, creative tech in a weird way is a funny thing. It's almost not a sector. It's like a network of individuals or group of people who do stuff that cross over lots of other sectors. So you have creative tech in agriculture, you have creative tech obviously in tourism. Um, so I think it's something where I think our network, the way I see it, has the ability to then support some of the other industries who aren't doing so well going forward and help them with their innovation. Um, mm. 
and and we're already seeing that with you know for example as i said the uber eats version new zealand version of uber eats which I, i'm trying to get the name of it i can't can't quite remember but it, it's like a, it's a it's like new zealand's own version of that a delivery system with a very small cut that's mm. a really very nice creative tech solution that supports um the hospo industry for example um and i think tourism will also some tourist business will also benefit from different kinds of ways of thinking about technology. Um, mm. One of the biggest things that happened out of this crisis is that a bunch of businesses who are hovering on the edge of needing to um, engage more in a virtual space have had to make that plunge, sorry to use the thing, um, much quickly, but more quickly than they would have, they've been, and, and I'd say teachers are in the same boat. Um, yep. Even city councils are in the same boat. I mean, if you have a look at the forums, people have been nagging them to have their meetings live streamed for like freaking how long, right? So now suddenly it's like amazingly they can do that. So I think yep. it's pushed a bunch of businesses over um, a disruptive edge. So now there's the capacity for many of those businesses to refine that and, and, and you know, go forward. That's why I'm saying don't, don't, don't invest a huge amount right now. Just... Get enough so that you can get out there and then just watch what's happening and then join some cool things and, and platforms and see what's really workable before you spend quite a lot of money on stuff. Um, but there is now, I think, going forward, there'll be a lot more resilience as I see it in lots of different other sectors or growing resilience. And, and to be honest, I mean, this is going to be one of many crises we face. We're still in a drought. Um, we're, we've got climate change already enacting stuff like droughts, et cetera, et cetera. So we're going to have to be more resilient around education, around how we sell, how we promote, um, all those things. And I think in a weird way, we've kind of been forced to start building that resilience now. Um, and I think um, that pe people in that network are now well placed to support that. So uh, how can, um, in closing, because I know we are going to go to for a short time, in closing, how can um, CTN support Northland Business? Uh, well, I think, as I said before, I mean, I think people are already doing that. Um, mm. CTN is a network. It's not really an organisation per se. You know, we're yeah. like a node or network or forming group. I think members of our network are already doing that really actively um, and um, various ways. And that can only happen more going forward. I encourage people if there are other sectors and they want to discuss ways that, you know, or, or have needs to get in touch with us. Um, and we can network to get them people that have the expertise. Um, I think generally speaking, uh, there's already people who are kind of enabling business anyway. So I think going forward, there'll just be more possibility. Generally speaking, anyway, it's useful to have a regional economy that's diversified. So yeah. having all your, as we've seen, having all your eggs in forestry, tourism, um, and related businesses isn't so useful when China's trade collapses and or we have a global pandemic, for example. Yeah. So resilience also means having diverse sectors and having an innovation sector that's based on tech, that's low carbon, high innovation, high value added in terms of industry pathways for youth getting into it, for me, is a mm -hmm. smart move for our region. Um, and agriculture, we should never have just them to begin with because actually agriculture is a core, primary business is a core aspect, but let's yeah. find ways to add value and connect with those other sectors so that we can make everyone more resilient going forward. That would be my argument anyway. Excellent. Well, um, thank you. Hopefully uh, more you know people who are um, who are considering what to do, trying to get their business up in, um, you know, a bit more um, diverse, a bit more te uh, technology orientated, who haven't thought about it or who have thought about it, you know, don't have the amount of money they thought they needed, you know, they can reach out to you, to you guys um, and, um, you know, to your members and say, you know, how do I go forward with this? Because I know a lot of people are going, to, especially small businesses, who are going to be skint or going to, going to need a hand um, hand to get go forward in this. Um, hopefully, you know, they can reach out because I think um, having a, a group like yourselves, you um, available to them uh, you know that's here already doing stuff so they don't have to go running somewhere else trying to pay someone to do it rather than just reach out and go hey what is on offer how do i go about this you know um especially 
especially if you, if they're not really, I mean, a lot of people aren't really aware of what is off, on offer, I think. Um, and the advice sometimes is more expensive than the product, you know, and I think. Oh, I yeah, yeah. That, I'm really, really, you know, people should not be spending significant amounts of money on, on, on digital infrastructure right now. You do as much as you need to get going and you look for other platforms to leverage and you connect with others. I think that's the smart way of doing it. Um, if anyone has questions about that, I'm always happy for people PM me. Um, but there are people in our network um, who are experts in the area. I'm happy to put them forward. Um, and we are we have got a couple of things coming out soon with some information around that stuff to help people. Um, and it's just a case of um, you know slow down and just um, just ask just a few people before you make the decision to invest significant amounts of money right now. And I would really hope that there wouldn't be anyone in our industry particularly who would be ripping anyone off. They'd be there trying to get them to do whatever's best for the most um, best value solution, essentially. Right. Um, thank you for your time, um, Maggie. I really appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thanks for um, being um, being with us. And hopefully, a lot of people got a lot of good uh, information out of it. And to everybody enjoying the day today, it uh, looked fantastic. Uh, and thank you again. And um, kakitano, guys. Um, we'll catch you next time. Thanks, Haru. <laughs>